relationships. And so we met back in verse 21, I think it was, of chapter 5. He said that we're all to be in subjection to one another. And then uh, we saw that God's expectation for wives was to be in subjection to their husband in the same way that they're in subjection to, to Christ. And so to honor and respect your husband the same way that you honor and respect Christ. And we know that that's not always easy. Sometimes it's because husbands aren't doing the things that they need to be doing. Then we saw the responsibilities given to husbands, which was to love our wives the same way that Christ loved the church. And then Paul elaborated quite a bit on the, the, the things that Christ gave up for the church, the sacrifice that he made. And so husbands have a responsibility to love their wives uh, in a sacrificial way. So, you know, if, if I don't like to do laundry, but that's my wife's love language, <laughs> then I need to learn that. And, or, or if it's vacuuming or windows or dusting or whatever, whatever those expressions of love, uh, that make her feel loved and appreciated. Those are the kinds of sacrifices that I need to be making. It's, you know, sometimes we think, oh, I'd lay my life down. Well, it's way, much, it's way much more than that because most of us will never be called to actually physically uh, lay our lives down for our spouses, but we all have an opportunity to make sacrifices to, to uh, encourage them and, and make their life better. And it's easier for me as a, a husband to speak to the guys than it is for me as a man to speak to the women. So I uh, appreciated the comments that were made that, that really, I think, helped us uh, come to a good understanding of what our responsibilities are. So this morning, he's going to start talking about the relationship between children and parents. And we invited the teen class to be upstairs this morning because, uh, not just this morning, but for the last couple of classes, because, you know, soon they will be uh, potentially husbands and wives. And so this is good information for them. There'll be dads and moms someday. And so this will help them. So when we look at um, chapter 6, verse 1, well, here's the outline for chapter 6. Verses 1 through 9 uh, from the commentary that I've been using, continue to walk in wisdom. So that's what a lot of this stuff in, in, in chapter 5, uh, about the middle of chapter 5 up until verse 9 of chapter 6 is about. Then he's going to talk about the armor of God. And then the end of the book is the benediction and a blessing of peace and comfort. So verse 1 in chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, this is, this is a command to children, but there's also a, a bit of responsibility given to parents because a child will not know how to obey their parent if the parent isn't doing something to train them. And we'll see that in a little bit. So, you know, children, the idea that's offspring, male or female. Now, it also would apply to a stepdad or, you know, some, you don't just have to have a child physically in order for you to be in a responsibility that you have to, to be their parent. So when, when, if, you know, if you're a, a stepson or a stepdaughter, uh, you still have a responsibility to obey your parents. Um, and when we talk about children, we're not talking, you know, about two-year-olds and three-year-olds um, because they really haven't come to understand yet the idea of, of what really obeying, obeying a parent is. So uh, I have on here living in full, in, de in full dependence of. So that's somebody who's depending on you to provide for them. So it's, it's not like your 25-year-old child. They're no longer to be in obedience to you in, this, in, in the context of this, uh, in, of this verse. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, a man should leave his uh, mother and father and cleave to his wife. So at some point in our, as we're growing up, we're no longer going to necessarily be in this obedience to, to your children. Uh, they have to be old enough, though, to actually understand this command. And that's why I say, you know, we're not talking about little little tiny kids uh, and, I, and I don't know the, the, the magic number I don't know if it's like when they're 10 or uh, 12 or 8 but uh, I, I, I think we kind of sense uh, as, we're, as we're raising them at some point they, they begin to learn and, be, and become accountable for their, for their actions do so you have a comment Steve? when they're 1 and 2 and 3 they may not know what the parent does and so 
giving, let, giving your kid the foundation uh, to be godly is important because you're teaching them that. Right. Even if they don't understand the words that you read in the Bible, the, the practical element of it, they, they should know, oh, I got this in one step. Right. And, and it seems like there's kind of an inherent, uh, and again, I don't know when it happens, but, but you know, from, from when our kids are, are, are babies, we're supposed to be raising them up and teaching them these things. But at some point, they kind of understand, oh, yeah, I, now I have, a, I have to do what my parents are telling me, instructing me to do. Did, Mike? This is also the foundation for the respect of all authority. This is where it starts. If, if a child isn't raised to respect his mom and dad, he's not going to respect government. He's, and most importantly, he's not going to respect God. Because this is all where it starts. This is, like Steve said, this is the foundation right. of, of, of that. And if we fail here, we fail. Period. I, I totally agree. <laughs> all right, so then... So that's the idea of children. Uh, obey means to listen attentively, to be fully compliant, to conform to a command. So um, I, I see we, we don't have a lot of kids up in here yet, um, but uh, you know, this is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to do what they say. Uh, so what kinds, of, what kinds of things might we want to, um, what kinds of things might we want our kids to listen to us about that are, that are, that are going to help build them and, and form their lives so that they might want to follow Christ. Um, and, and again, we don't, we're not talking about little tiny kids, I don't think, but um, how about read a chapter in your Bible today? Uh, that's, if, if that's what a parent asks you to do, you should be willing to do that. Uh, learn to love Jesus. Uh, respect adults. These are the kinds of things that, that, that we're teaching our kids to obey. Um, clean your room. Do your homework. Uh, oftentimes we see children that, that you know, they get resistance, uh, re resistant to, to wanting to do these kinds of things. Uh, oftentimes we're not setting a good example. Uh, you know, it's one thing to tell, to tell your children to do something and not model it for them. That's not a very, really effective way of training them. Uh, so we've got to be willing to, to walk the, the talk. Molly? And learn to resolve differences. To live in peace with each other yeah. and, and learn how to resolve those differences that are going to come up. Yeah, he's going to talk about not, dads not provoking their kids to wrath, which... I think falls right in that learning how to, to deal uh, if effectively with our kids. Uh, parents, that's, uh, and then he says to your, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. So the idea of parents in the Lord, uh, a parent technically is a begetter, you know, somebody to produce children, or we would say a mom or a dad. And, and the idea of uh, in the Lord is in compliance or according to, the, to God's will. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of different ideas that people have about what, what this uh, means, parents in the Lord. So one is um, things that are agreeable to the mind and the will of the Lord. That could be in uh, according to the, or you obey your parents in the Lord. The second one um, is, let's see, in the Lord, things that are agreeable to the mind and will of the Lord, or because it is a command of the Lord. So things that are not contrary to God's will. I don't think it's specifically talking about a, a child that ha has already come to faith in Christ. So that was another uh, pretty common uh, thing that I read in the commentaries. It just makes sense to me that it's really, it's talking about our kids as we're raising them. Uh, again, that the age, uh, it's not an age-specific thing, but, but when they start to, to know and understand uh, what, what it is that we're trying to teach them as parents. The idea of to do what is right, uh, that means upright, righteous, virtuous, uh, proper, keeping the commands of God, um, and it's God's expectation of children. And so that's something that we really need to emphasize to our kids. This is what God's expectation of you is. 
the parent is going to be the um, the vehicle that is used to uh, train the child up in this and to, to get to give them this mindset um, so uh, some other things that I put on here you know don't don't if you know don't torture your siblings that's that seems to be something that's pretty common amongst kids today uh, put away the laundry pick up after yourselves don't play with matches don't put your hand under a running lawnmower uh, I, 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 I had a guy that came to work uh, with me years ago, and he was from the, from the Las Vegas area where they don't have lawns. And he came into work one day and had a huge bandage on his hand. And I thought, well, how, how can he even come to work like that? You know, and he's like, I said, what happened? He said, I put my hand under the lawnmower. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I, ne I never had a lawnmower. I didn't realize it didn't stop instantly. And, you know, he wanted to put, put his hand in there to clean some grass out or something. So, you know, kids, listen to your parents. Uh, you can avoid lots of problems uh, by listening to your parents because they have lots of wisdom. Any more qu qu questions? Yeah, Joe. The way I see it here is on the in the Lord. Yeah. For me, it's like you can say in Christ or in the Lord. You know, mm -hmm. here. And I think that Paul, to me, is, is differentiating from a godly family and an ungodly family to some extent here. Um, if you have parents that aren't in Christ or in the Lord or in the church, right. they could be instructing their kids in a way that's ungodly. And I think Paul's trying to differentiate there. And the kids, you know, I don't think Paul wants them to instruct their kids to do something that's sinful or ungodly. And you obey them no matter what. So I mean, right. and the way I see that is that's, that's what Paul's getting at here. That's a good point. And again, we know this letter was written to Christians. And so uh, this applies to Christian parents. It's, it certainly is good wisdom and, and could apply to any parent. But the point I think that, that you're making is accurate, that uh, if an ungodly parent was saying, you know, you, you don't need to read your Bible. You can't read your Bible. You shouldn't go worship. Uh, those kinds of things that are contrary to God's teaching those would be things where it would really be a challenge for a child. Uh, John and then Bruce. If these were mostly Gentiles, then I would think that Paul would say this because Jews, they knew that was God said, honor your father and mother, that's one of the commandments. So maybe he's bringing this up to let them know that this is what God wants of them. Right. They're not, maybe they're not familiar with God's law or possibly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I think probably over the course of time, uh, maybe until just recently, it seems like it's a more recent thing, but it seems like, you know, parents, there's always been an expectation of kids to obey their parents. Um, it seems to us probably living in this day and time that all oh, things are just way out of balance and Becky and I were talking recently it se seems like every generation can say that to their oh I'm you know I'm, this generation is really bad but I, probably the generations before us as they saw a change happening they saw a decline in in uh, the interactions between people they they most likely had a similar uh, thought Jesus told his disciples that <clears throat> there would come a time when uh, daughters will turn against their mothers, sons will turn against their fathers, and, and the whole issue was centered around Jesus Christ as being the, the predominant factor in the, in the person's life. And, and he, he may have been alluding more to young adult children or adult children to turning against their parents for, for the sake of Christ. But that he, he was number one and he expected to be worship as number one. Right. And that's, again, that's going to be an example that we have to model for our kids. Tim and then Becky. Well, we know as Christians that uh, bringing our children up in the Lord works. But the thing that really parents need to realize, and I have to realize, especially because I'm, I'm the father of the family, that I'm going to re be responsible for my children getting to heaven, my wife, everybody. And I've got to get it right. 
I have to do it God's way because God's way is the right way and I prove it. I have proven it and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that children will fall away. But still, I have to look at myself. If my children fall away, I still have to look at myself and I, I'm a father forever. Yeah. Hey, you have that responsibility to train up your children in the way of the Lord, but you're not responsible whether they make it to heaven or not. Every one of us has to make a choice at some point. So all dads have a responsibility to, to raise up their children, but at the end of the day, you're, I, I don't, I'm not responsible uh, whether they make it to heaven. I'm responsible whether I've done my part, but, but in the end, yeah. Steve? Or, yeah. It says you have to give an account for right. people's soul. That doesn't mean you have to, you're responsible for the final outcome. It's just, did you do your part in, right. in helping them and serving them as a shepherd? And it's the same thing as parents. I can I'm, help out every step of the way. Yes. And I was just going to say, as it is within the rest of this, he's talking <coughs> to children about this because he knows it's not easy for children to always obey their parents. Yeah. And so he's. I think in a sense when he's saying, he's saying, I know this is going to be hard, kids, but, you know, you've got to obey your parents. And so he's encouraging them, not necessarily making it feel hard. You know, he wants, to, he wants them to know this is hard, but you can do this. Right. And, and there's a great reward for it, too. I mean, we're going to see, uh, you know, when, when children do obey their parents, when they honor their mother and father, really there's a promise uh, from God that, that things can go well for them. It's not, a, it's not like you know, nobody will ever die young if they're obeying their parents, but d generally speaking, there's a great benefit to kids when they, when they follow God's instruction in this. And remember, this is God's instruction to kids. It's not, you know, your dad, even though we might say, you know, you're supposed to obey me, Ultimately, what I want to emphasize is this is God's instruction to kids, just like it was God's instruction to wives and to husbands. And this whole section where he talks about relationships and dealing with each other, all of it has rewards. Yeah. He may not, spe may not be specifying the fact of, you know, the reward of a wife being in submission to her husband or a husband loving the wife. Um, but, but every single one of these um, commands uh, uh, instructions carries a reward of its own yeah. and we need to be aware of that you know I'm not just putting myself under uh, uh, under submission of my spouse just cuz that there are definitely benefits for me. all right let's go to uh, the next verse honor your mother and father which is the first commandment with the promise so the word honor there means to fix value to prize to revere uh, it includes respect and admiration, and there's no statute of limitations, uh, that's the word I used here, for honoring and, and uh, your mother and father. The idea of obeying your parents, again, I, I believe that when you leave the home, when you're out on your own, the responsibility that you have to obey them in that same sense changes. But the idea of honoring your mother and father, there is no expiration date on that. Uh, father and mother, that's both, both parents. It's not conditional. Uh, you, don't, you know, it doesn't matter if they, well, I had really crummy parents, so I, I'm not going to honor and I'm not going to honor them. That's not uh, what the Holy Spirit wants us to get here. Um, I'll get to you in a minute, John. Um, so we're to honor them even if they weren't ideal parents. We're to take care of them, uh, you know, as needed. So, uh, The, so well, here, let me just uh, read what I have you f have for my notes here. Um, so, uh, you know, Matt and Nola are in a situation right now where their parents are older and they're starting to have some needs. And uh, a way that, that Matt can honor his parents in their old age is to do the th similar things for them that they did for him in his young age. Uh, he's going to have to help them 
meet their spiritual needs. He's going to have to help meet their physical needs, uh, their financial needs. All of those things that, that, that parents did for kids when they were little, there's an opportunity for uh, kids to, to do that for their parents in their old age. Um, so there's, there might come a day when uh, you know, you're going to sit uh, at your mom or dad's bedside and maybe you have to read scripture to them because they can no longer do it. Um, maybe you have to sit there and pray with them or pray for them. Maybe you'll sing hymns to them because you know that, that, you know, that that's something that brings joy to them. Uh, maybe you'll have to be driving them to their appointments. You know, they took you to soccer and baseball and Cub Scouts and every, every other thing they did for you. Now you're driving them to their doctor's appointments. Uh, or maybe you're taking them shopping or those kinds of things. These are ways that we can express uh, honoring our parents uh, in their old age. Um, <clears throat> maybe you have to, maybe they have to move in with you. Uh, maybe they can no longer live on their own. Maybe, uh, maybe they didn't uh, make adequate financial uh, decisions, and so you have to help supplement their income. Uh, these are all ways that, um, especially in our day, that we can honor our parents. In that culture back then, you know, families didn't kind of separate so much like they do nowadays. You know, oftentimes families were in very close proximity to, to each other. Sometimes they shared the same dwellings, so they didn't. They didn't have a degree of separation like we have today. Uh, then he says the first command with a promise. So uh, this is a special promise. It's, it's uh, a divine assurance of good. So it wasn't, you know, if you went back to the Ten Commandments, you, I think it was the, oh, I think the second or third commandment said that, um, you know, that there was a general promise to everyone that served God. Uh, I think the reference here that it's the first command with a promise, uh, the idea that you would, you know, things would go well for you. I think it's in the next verse. Let me just double check. Um, yeah, so that it may be well with you and that you would live long on the earth. Um, and then I'll elaborate on that uh, when we get to that verse. Did you have a comment, John? Pretty well said. Any, any other questions or comments on that verse? category of things that we teach them from the get. Early stages, it, it's almost all safety. You know, don't touch the hot stove. Stay away from a boiling pot. Look both ways before you cross the street. And, and then as they get older, then we start getting into more details on, you know, morality and, and structure and, 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 and stuff of this nature. And, you know, the idea that, you know, you live long, maybe sometimes, you know, well, I'll say, when I repeat that, so you'll live longer if you listen to your parents. Yeah. Because guess what? You don't look both ways before you cross the street. You're going to be a 45 mile an hour corner, which is not going to be a, a good outcome for you. So, you know, these, it's, it's this building block of things that we teach our children. It's really important. Uh, again, it, it comes in stages uh, according to their ability to understand and their ability not to understand. To tell them something they have no concept of is, is useless. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like uh, that, generally speaking, we have a tendency to focus way more on those physical things than we do on the spiritual things. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll go at length about don't play in the street and look both ways and don't play with matches. And, and, and sometimes it's easy for us to neglect the spiritual side of it, making sure that we're sitting down with our kids and reading the Bible and, and praying with our kids and uh, encouraging them in the Lord and doing spiritual things because we just get so focused on the physical things. Uh, Arlene, did you have a comment? No, there's a bottom line. The bottom line is our relationship. God is love. When we pay attention to Him on a regular basis and study His work and follow Him, we are an example not just to our children but to everyone that we meet. And that is our main goal 
is to keep in a relationship with the Lord and our own attitudes will follow. Yeah. Because we're reading his word on how to obey. And we have to make sure that we're modeling that to our kids. Tim. Yeah, I understand that we are going to stand on one of the four We're responsible. What I'm interested in, and I'm not very eloquent sometimes, is we are an example to our children forever. Yeah, yeah. And I want to stand before God knowing that I did the best I could. Right. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think, I, I, I'm sure that's what I got from you saying. All right, next verse then. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So that was the promise that he's referring to. To be well meant to be well off, to fare well, to prosper, uh, in joy and happiness and contentment and peace. Uh, those things can all be a byproduct of, of being obedient and honoring parents. Uh, to live long, that meant to have a longer physical life. And, you know, you could ask the question, why? Mike kind of already started that. There's wisdom in avoiding sinful behaviors that shorten life. So uh, in their culture, things were, you know, different than they are in, all, in our culture. Uh, the things that we're, you know, focusing on, on teaching our kids to avoid today are things like drugs and alcohol and sexually transmitted diseases and don't text while you drive and um, don't get involved in crime because all of those behaviors have a tendency to shorten your lifespan. Uh, you know, there was a big meth craze here back in the late 90s where, you know, we ran on meth labs, I don't know, two or three a week, it seemed like. And you would see very young people, young adults, uh, you know, who, who got caught up in this stuff. And, and they're, you could just tell they were, they were in a downward spiral to, spiral to an early death. Uh, and... My guess is that on, on some level, they probably stopped listening to the advice and counsel of wise people. Now, you know, sometimes parents make bad choices, too. And every, parent, every parent's not a good parent. We know that. Uh, but kids should be listening to wise counsel. And, and the, generic, the generic promise is that it's gonna, you're gonna, there's going to be a benefit to it. Uh, I got on here your work ethic. So uh, hard work as a general rule promotes good health. So that would be another th thing of wisdom that, that a good, good parents are going to be teaching their kids. Um, spiritual activity and physical activity, being faithful to God, reading your Bible, praying, worshiping, serving, um, and then you know, leaving, leading a healthy lifestyle, being active <clears throat> versus sedentary. It seems to me like regularly you'll be you'll talk to people who spend multiple hours in a day playing video games. Uh, and, you know, they'll say, well, I'm active, you know, I'm engaged in the game, but that's not the same thing, I don't think, as being physically active. Uh, people who are physically active have a tendency to have a healthier life and so potentially going to live uh, longer on on the earth and again it's a generic promise any questions or comments about that verse bruce the example of, of uh, what happens when adult children don't do this uh, probably the best example in scripture is, is uh, samson you know he did not honor his mother and father in, in, in a choice of a wife he didn't honor them in a number of different ways and his life from the time that he dishonored them Right up until the last days of his life, uh, was a train wreck. Yeah. He was an absolute mess, you know. And for all we know, he didn't really live to be a ripe old age. Yeah. Um, so again, kids, there's wisdom in listening to your parents. All right. Uh, now some instructions to dads. Uh, and, you know, here's, I, I, was I, I wasn't good at this. <laughs> this would be something I was a shortcoming for me. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instructor, instruction of the Lord. So, fathers, this, I think, is going to place some uh, added emphasis and responsibility on dads. Um, this 
responsibility was given first to dads. Now, if there's a, if there's a, a home and there's no dad present, whose responsibility does it become? The mom. Um, because it still has to be done, uh, raising up your children. Don't provoke your children to anger. Provoke means to rouse, to wrath, to exasperate, to, to provoke. Uh, I think this happens. We do, how, do we, how do we exasperate our kids? Uh, or, well, our attitudes, uh, our words, our actions. Um, you know, maybe it's severe discipline. It's harsh demands. Uh, it's a, an abuse of authority, arbitrariness, unfairness, nagging, and condemnation. Uh, you know, sometimes our kids get us riled up, don't they? B- because of what, the things that they do. Um, because they're kids, they're, they're, they're growing. Sometimes uh, we're, we're responsible because we haven't been doing our job correctly, but uh, it's taking and, and, and potentially uh, having a punishment that doesn't really befit the uh, grievance that was caused. Like, you know, I was notorious for saying, well, you're grounded for a month. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty unreasonable. Uh, but it was the first thing that came to my mind, and most of the time, it never, I could never carry it out. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's the tone of your voice, the harshness that's, that you're allowing to come out when you're dealing with uh, disciplinary or corrective issues with your kids. Um, and I suspect that probably most dads have um, had this happen to you. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure of any perfect dads in here. Uh, maybe Steve. Oh, he's pretty good. <laughs> maybe Joe. His, his son's here today. We'll, we'll ask him later. <laughs> um, but it's easy for, I think, for dads to, you know, lose some self-control. And uh, so really, this is we're speaking to dads now. We're not to be provoking our children to wrath and anger. And, you know, words like stupid. Uh, any, any dad ever use that word? That, you were so stupid. Uh, or that was stupid. That's a very demeaning, hurtful word. And there's other ways you can, you know, you could say, well, that was a really poor choice. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the moment and we, we say things that, that really are not befitting of us as Christians. We shouldn't, we should try to take a minute. Uh, I, I was trying to give some advice to some young dads at work and I said, you know, it's easy to get mad. And I said, you just got to take a minute. Or, or if you set a boundary, then as soon as the boundary is crossed, deal with it right then. Don't, don't say next time. Next, and if you do that another time, if you do that another time, because after the third or fourth time, you are going to be mad. And then you're going to react in a way that can be harmful. Steve? What if John the Baptist, part of his mission was to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, but when you hear his teaching, it had nothing to do with how, you, how you're a father, what it all had to do with how do you live according to the word of God. And one of the ways we provoke our children is through uh, not holding God's standard in a variety of ways, but if we're not being faithful, if we're uh, not showing commitment to serving God, if we're uh, being hypocrites and all those, you know, being unjust in, our, in the way we measure out uh, um, retribution to our kids and things like, you know, if, if, we're, if we're not looking up the God standard, having a double standard, things like that, that provokes our children. Because they see uh, that they, they know justice, they, you know, even a baby, if you snap something out of their hands, they're going to cry at you because they know that's unjust. And so, you know, the injustice provokes and um, being wrong provokes. And so one of, our, one of the ways we can turn our hearts to our children and to, to our families is by um, emphasizing our own obedience to God. Yeah, set a good example. Oh, let's see. Fathers are to teach their children the word of God, teach them to read scripture, teach them to pray, teach them to enjoy, to enjoy worshiping God, to raise their children to be followers of Christ, productive in the community and in the church, and teach by example. So as a, as a dad, you know, sometimes my mantra was do as I say, not as I do. Now, I wasn't, you know, typically out there 
getting caught up in sin, but, you know, I would say, you know, I want you to go whatever it was, uh, clean your room. Uh, but sometimes they could look at my area where I don't keep things clean, and, and that would be not me not keeping, not setting a good example. So just important for dads, make sure that we're setting a good example. Bring them up in the dis- discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, to bring up means to nourish, to bring to maturity, to raise them up to adults. Uh, education and training that leads to full development of mind and morals. Uh, the instruction of the Lord is to admonish, and it, it's a warning through teaching counsel to reach a godly solution. So the responsibility given to dads is to train up our children uh, in, the di- in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So that's praying with them. Reading with reading scripture with them, being a good example, showing them how important it is to worship, showing them how to worship, not letting worldly things uh, take a priority over spiritual things. Any questions or comments on this, Joe? I just wanted to mention what you, you mentioned about the provoking thing about uh, the parent being angry, and I thought that was really good because you know if a child disobeys you and you get angry. You try to discipline when you're angry; it's going to provoke them to anger too. So sometimes it may be just good to say, "Hey, let's take a break. You think about it, and then we'll talk about it." You know, yeah. because that's happened to me more than once in my second. Yeah, failure. yeah, yeah that's angry. that's great advice for young for young dads. I, I see we at least got one or two in here. Yeah, Becky. I like what he says in Colossians. We talked about this too. He says, "So that you don't discourage them." Yeah. So it's, you know, I think that just puts a great emphasis on it. Yeah. All right, let's go to verse 5. Then he's going to stop, so he's going to start talking about another set of relationships, and it's, it's the slave-master relationship. This was very common in that day and age. Not as common as it is for us today, but there's still some great applications that we can make. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Slaves were, were someone that belongs to another, a servant. Today we, prob- we have a tendency to, and I think it's, it's applicable, to say the employer-employee relationship. Uh, I'm not a slave to my employer, but I am a servant to them. Um, so he says to be obedient, so that's fully compliant. The idea is to conform to a command, and there's an expectation when you have an employer-employee relationship that what they ask you to do or tell you to do is what you're going to do. Um, he's who are your masters according to the flesh, so that's a person exercising absolute ownership rights, earthly masters contrasted with the master, which would be the Lord. Uh, do it according to the flesh with fear and trembling. That's reverence or respect, and it's used to describe the anxiety of one who, dis, who distrusts his ability to completely meet all the requirements, but, but religiously does it his, uh, his utmost to fulfill his duty. So you're, you're doing your very best to, um, to do whatever it is that's required of you. And, and in the sincerity of your heart... Uh, Full of integrity, recognizing that their service to their earthly master was a demonstration of obedience to Christ. So um, if we take this and put it in the sphere of the employer-employee relationship, it it makes perfect sense to me. And it's the same... it's the same kind of expectation if... I, I, I was never really an employer, per se. Most of my life I was an employee, and I tried to uh, go to work with the attitude, okay, I I, want to be a good worker. I want to be recognized as a hard worker. I want to do my best. And I I tried to remind myself, I'm working for the Lord. People are, if I claim I'm a Christian, people are looking at me, maybe a little bit more differently than they look at everybody else. And I just want to make sure that that I'm performing to, to, to... a level that demonstrates that I work for the Lord. Um, slavery was an accepted way of life in Paul's day. Some Christian converts would be in both groups, so they, you know, these people would be converted. Maybe, maybe they used to be a slave. Maybe they used to be a master. Now there's some instructions that Paul's giving, like, hey, 
you know, you need to treat one another a little bit differently now because you're Christians. And the key is, as to Christ, um, did, did you have a comment, sir? That's just a quick, I think you really good point. I've got a sister in Christ now. I haven't talked to her in years. But she's still my sister in Christ because she observed one of our members at work handling some pretty stressful situations at work <clears throat> on multiple occasions. And she comes to our sister and says, basically, Don't, 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 do not serve by, by way of eye, serve, eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, not as eye service. So service performed only when the master's looking. Uh, you never ever heard somebody say, oh, the boss is coming, everybody look busy. Well, you know, that's not, a, that's not the right attitude to have at work. The right attitude to have is, I've been given a job. I'm going to work on my job. I'm going to stay productive. I'm going to just keep doing it. I'm not just going to up my game when the boss is around. Sometimes that same attitude, the eye service, look busy, you know, do busy work, but then don't actually follow through with things, you know, present yourself a certain way at church, but at home, you're not actually doing what you present to as much as you present yourself to be doing, all those things, and, it, it, you know, there's two sides to that, right? It's one is, it says, you're a slave to Christ, um, so be obedient to him and act like that. And, and the second part is, is, and part of that is also serving those who have authority over you in the same way. But, it, but there's really, a, I think, applying that to our own Christian walk, because I yeah. think many people, that a lot of times, this is neglected uh, to your own detriment. Right. So, yeah, I think it's good to bring verse 9 into this right now. And masters do the same thing to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours in heaven their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And uh, so I think it's good to bring that up because when he's instructing slaves, he's instructing slaves with masters that have this. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's great that he does turn around and address the master also. Um, you're, if you're a Christian master, maybe you used, maybe you used to be somebody that was uh, unjust to your slaves. You need to change the way that you treat people now because you are a Christian. Um, doing God's will from the heart so we, we render acceptable service to God when we perform the services which are demanded of us in the situation in life where, we can, where we're placed, however humble that may be. So if I'm a slave, be a really good slave. If I'm a, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a dishwasher, be a really good dishwasher. Strive to be a cook too, but... The job that you're doing now, do it to the best of your ability. With goodwill, render service as to the Lord and not to men. Goodwill, that's kindliness, enthusiasm, zeal, a pos to be positive. Render service, uh, to be a slave or to, to serve or to do service. Uh, do it as if to the Lord. So remember, who are you working for ultimately? Who, who are you always setting an example to? Or, uh, or of, you're supposed to be modeling after Christ, be imitators of God, uh, not to men, not just to men. So the godly attitude of service is having a proper heart. All of my services is to be performed as though Jesus is the benefactor. All right, we only made it through seven verses. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, Steve. What he's saying here is, it's the pay you're getting is doesn't is not your paycheck. Yeah. You know, that's not why you're doing it. And really through this whole section, why should you be a godly wife or follow the instructions for wives? Because you're honoring Jesus. And why should you be a good husband? Because you're honoring Jesus. Why should you obey your parents? Because you're honoring Jesus. And you know, we're working for an eternal reward. Um, the paycheck is just, a, you know, a side element to your work. But the work that you do is actually... Um, for the purpose of uh, earning something uh, before the Lord, or, or uh, honoring God, and, and earning and working towards that reward. So, all right. Not 
of time, we'll have a prayer and we'll be dismissed in between service. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this uh, time to study your word. We pray that you would continue to bless us with open hearts and minds and uh, may our uh, may our knowledge of you and, and the wisdom that we gain uh, from your word increase that we can be better suited, better suited to serve you in this life. And we just pray God to continue to be with us.